Welcome to Possibility Project. We are a growing community of disruptive change makers, reclaiming our power through meaningful sparks, connections, and actions. And this is our 17th episode that you have joined today. So I would love for you to check out any previous episodes that you might have missed, including Sabrina's. Um, on the website, you go to possibilityproject.org. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel and get those alerts when we post new episodes. And I also want to call out the amazing work of one of our friends and supporters, Mickey Desai. So Mickey leads the podcast nonprofit Snapcast. And he has another podcast as well. He's just launching called Inclusion Catalyst. So Devin's going to put those links in the chat. Um, what Mickey does is he edits those recordings that we publish on YouTube and he puts them on his podcast as well. So I would definitely encourage you to check out his podcast and support his work as he supports ours. He's a great community member. So please check him out. And when we do our introductions, we use the Zoom introduction guidelines that were shared with us by one of our amazing previous speakers, Nova Ren from Genesis Healing Institute. So Devin's gonna put a link to those. Nova has generously shared those with anyone that wants to use them when you're starting any of your meetings. And we like to follow those um, when you can access them as well. So my name is Heather Hiscox. I use she, her pronouns. I'm coming to you from the land that was kept, kept and held as sacred by the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki people. I honor these ancestral keepers of this land where I am now living, and I honor the descendants who continue to breathe sacred life into our earth. And following the intro, Devin and I want to definitely recognize that land acknowledgments are just a tiny, tiny part about disrupting and dismantling colonial structures. And if you want to learn more about the land that you occupy, you can check out the link that Devin's going to put from Native Land um, that you can also text um, a phone number and it will tell you the land that you occupy and you can start to use that in acknowledgements as well. And for anyone that might be differently abled visually, um, I want to describe myself physically. I have red hair, fair skin, freckles, blue eyes, and I'm wearing a purple shirt and a light blue room. Um, and we will provide a transcript of today's episode um, provided by Otter. So we will send that to you in the thank you email. So if that's a better way for you to take in the knowledge and information, you can read that as well. And I just want to introduce Devin and myself in more detail. So Devin Davey is a strategy consultant helping female social entrepreneurs and networks by co-designing and implementing people and process solutions. You can learn more about her work at devindavy.com and that link will be in the, in the chat. And I'm Heather Hiscox, I'm the CEO and founder of Pause for Change. So I work with nonprofits, foundations and local governments to help them solve problems more efficiently and effectively. So Devin and I started Possibility Project when COVID was hitting um, the US and really wanted to take this moment of um, the shifts that we saw happening and the the openness to change and the new conversations and more disruptive work that was happening to really capture this moment to emerge stronger and better and more equitable and just than we have been in the past as a sector. So that's what this is all about is having these conversations that we need to have in community. If you want to support this work, we would love your generosity. If you go to opencollective.com slash possibility project, you can make any size gift to make this work possible. And we would so appreciate it. We absolutely would love your support. And these are the four goals of Possibility Project to give you a bit more context before we jump in. We want to unite a community of diverse change makers. We want to stimulate new thinking and a thirst for deeper change explore collaboratively what is possible and examine our role in transformation starting with ourselves. And what the agenda is gonna look like for today and for all of our episodes is that we're gonna talk a little bit about the why, we're gonna meet our amazing guests and then you all will meet someone else that's here today. We do some group sharing and small pairing sharing. And then our guests will give a brief lightning talk about our first question that we always ask in every episode about what dysfunctions we wanna disappear from the sector, in this case related to radical allyship. And then our guests will um, talk about what's emerging and giving them hope. We'll open it up to Q&A. So please keep the chat active and alive. We want to hear what's standing out to you. We want to one up each other's comments. We want to ask those questions and all of that. So please keep that going. 
Um, and then we're going to have breakout groups. We try to fit most of the content within the first hour if you do have to jump off for another meeting or commitment. But we will, for all of you that stick around, we have our breakout rooms where you get a chance to meet others in this community and really debrief and discuss what you've heard from our speakers today and how you're feeling. And then we'll debrief a bit and then uh, talk about our next episode on May 11th. So these are our amazing speakers and our amazing topic. Uh, Trella is really, Trella Walker is uh, the, what really, she really inspired us, a conversation that Devin and I had with Trella around allyship and asking this question of what happens when white folks get tired? What does it mean to show up? How do you show up? And, you know, what does it mean to share power and, and all of that? And it was just such a great conversation. We thought this has got to be a larger panel topic. And so uh, thank you, Trella, for, for really bringing that to light and supporting us in this. So we wanted to go deeper about all of the pieces that are associated with allyship. And we're joined by our amazing guests who are all experts in their own right and just have such amazing information to share. So we are a little bit different in how we introduce our guests. Our guests are just such whole people and such amazing folks that we will read you a tiny bit of who they are and then Devin's gonna post in the, oh, she's already posting in the chat, the bios of our speakers. But we ask each of our speakers to tell a little story, something interesting about themselves that um, just give us a sense of who they are. So we get to see them as whole people. So I'm gonna stop sharing so we can see our speakers. So I'm gonna start with you Trella, give you a heads up. Uh, so Trella um, is Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer of the Nonprofit Finance Fund. And Trella came to this work from an unexpected place. And so Trella, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Sure. So how I ended up as Chief Strategy Officer at a nonprofit finance institution um, is weird because I actually came from Debbie Allen Dance Academy um, and uh, worked with dance and artists and celebrities and in, in trying to bring dance to our communities. So it was a it was a great journey. And I tell everybody when I'm working and doing community work, you know, and they're like, oh, this is really hard. I'm like, there's nothing harder than a black dance mom. So <laughs> Keep that in context. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Our next guest panelist today is a Toby Scruggs Hussein. So Toby is a thought leader um, cultivating consciousness, conscious, connected, courageous leaders worldwide with her racial healing allies, visionary work, and all the amazing activities that she has going on. You definitely got to check out Toby's website to engage so Toby, I want to hear uh, our interesting tale about an experience that you had and related to uh, a certain MJ. <laughs> I was just straddling which story to tell too. Okay. All of a sudden, all of a sudden. So um, a little known fun fact, just to try to keep the space um, a little light at times, is that when I was in third grade, I had the pleasure of both learning about spirituality and a great entertainer who I really admired, Michael Jackson. And at the time in third grade, my best friend's father was directing the Can You Feel It video. Some of us might be too young on the call to know about that Can You Feel It video. And if you're not, I'm the little black girl in the video who does the whole point and stare and like the glitters coming down. And um, I got to meet him and I prayed that night that I could be in a video of his or work with him in some way. And it ended up happening just within like 24 hours. So really fun. Thanks, Sabrina. <laughs> I don't feel so alone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to find the link. We'll have to put the clip in later so we can all watch it again. That's so awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And last but not least, um, the amazing Flora Larson of Flora Larson Facilitation is joining us. From Seattle. And uh, Flora has an interesting complication with living in the Pacific Northwest that she's going to share. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Great to be here. Great to be with you. Um, I grew up here in Seattle. My background is I'm um, Norwegian and German. And um, my family, my dad worked in Alaska. He wasn't a fisherman, but he worked in Alaska. Um, and my family ate fish like five nights a week. I am consequently allergic to fish. And so they just would always buy me a chicken, like, like get Flora chicken, get her a chicken. Let's go get a chicken. Um, and I, so there was a period of time where I couldn't. I was like, I'm sick of chicken. Um, another kind of food related thing is I'm recently pregnant. So 
so I'm feeling nauseous or waves of nausea. So you might see me nibbling on snacks and that's just to abate that. So I appreciate your kind of graciousness with me rolling with um, how I'm feeling right now. So all things food related are, are happening over here. So great to be with you. Yay. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing your story and sharing your amazing and exciting news. We're so excited to be with you and we, we will hold space for whatever you got to do. We got to step away, have a cracker, have some water, whatever you need to do. We are here for you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So we are going to jump into why we're here is to have a conversation about radical allyship and the word radical, uh, why I put them there. I was really inspired by a conversation I saw with Edgar Villanueva from Decolonizing Wealth. And he was talking about people calling him radical. And, and he looked it up in the dictionary. And one of the definitions he saw that is that radical meant to the root, to the core, like to the center of, of meaning or of something. And he thought, all right, if someone wants to call me radical, I'm getting to the root, I'm getting to the core. I'm, I'm really you know, interrogating and understanding what's really at the essence. And so that, that was one of the, the words that we thought was interesting to pair with allyship. And in our call with um, our amazing speakers that we have for preparation, we had so many great questions and great conversations, such thought provocation, inspiration. So I'm just excited to get started. So we're going to start with the question that we ask in every episode is what dysfunctions do we want to disappear that are happening right now with radical allyship? And I'm wondering if I can start with you, Trella. You want to take it away? Sure. Um, actually, you know, I, I shared with the group before we all joined that I had a lot on my mind thinking about, um, I don't know if anybody saw the Oscars on Sunday and Tyler Perry's speech during the humanitarian award, but he was really saying that, you know, we've gotten to the point where everybody has grabbed a corner and I'm, I'm, re I'm reading his quote, everybody's grabbed a corner and a color. Nobody wants to come to the middle to have a conversation. And what I'm, you know, concerned about is this consistent orientation to it's like it's one way or the other and we're having such a challenge with trying to find out how to meet in the middle when you start talking about race relations and equity and belonging we have to meet in the middle we have to you know set aside the the hard stands that we take and try to see each other and see our vulnerability and see where we can meet and so I'm hoping that we are able to have more and more conversations and not less and less um, as we navigate our country moving forward. It's really heavy on my mind right now. Thank you for that. Thank you. And we'll, oh, there, it looks like there's a, a link. Oh, Devin put in there. Thank you, Devin, of what Charles is mentioning. Thank you so much for talking about that, that meeting in the middle, really important. Uh, Toby, let's shift to you. What, what dysfunctions do you want to disappear? I'm loving that I'm piggybacking off of what Trella shared because it really does align because part of the dysfunction that I'm seeing is very much the same. And part of my contribution through my own growth, part of my contribution to this work as I've evolved and emerged is that allyship is really two sides of the same coin. And that often we don't see it as that. And so I want to offer a paradigm shift, much like what's starting to emerge from um, thought leaders of color, from Trella, from Tyler Perry, from me, whoever, and that there's just this current definition of allyship can be kind of othering and that it's something that white people do. White people are responsible for allyship. And I want to say no, that we're all responsible for allyship in some way, for, for healing to occur, for growth to occur, to use the words from Trella and Tyler Perry, we have to come in the middle. When we are allies, we reach this mutual agreement to really be of support to each other and to hold each other accountable and standing in that intention. And so when I think about allyship and the way that I want to see it start to happen in our world, it's really a spiritual relationship, almost like a marriage, almost like a best friendship, almost like a, you know, a sisterhood or brotherhood, a deep friendship. And when we stand in that agreement with that intention, a set of behaviors follow suit, a set of behaviors happens. And for white people that can look like integrity, skills, understanding, accountability, 
And for people of color, I really see it for us in terms of patience, greater sense of patience, um, support, not at the point, at least where we're like personal tutors, but support where we're willing to play that role of sometimes creating the deeper awareness, sometimes being that one who's going to speak up and, and, and be what Zaretta Hammond calls a warm demander. So how can we serve as that accountability partner in a, in a way, and yet still honoring the explicit boundaries and high expectations that we set? So in the framework that I offer, we have a name for it that white people are considered revolutionary allies and that people of color I've named sublime allies. Because for us to be allies, in spite of all the atrocities, insults, and repeated offenses that happen not only in the last several hundred years, but current day, it takes nothing short of us than to be sublime. And sublime is characterized by being noble, majestic, of high spiritual, moral, and intellectual worth. And for us to show up in that way and... Um, not create insurrections is nothing short of sublime. And so just offering that allyship is two sides of the same coin. I love that movie. Thank so you. helpful. Yeah, in the chat, lots of folks are lifting up what you're what you're saying. Thank you for that. Fleur, we want to hear your thoughts about some oh. of those functions. Absolutely. Thank you, Trella and Toby, for um, leading us in here. Um, I think about some things that need to shift um, in the nonprofit sector, but also inward in, in myself and primarily looking at shifting performative um, allyship or performative activism to real solidarity. Um, and that really invites in an intrinsic motivation, in particular for white folks to see how our liberation is absolutely wrapped up in this work. It's not a doing for um, the paternalism that's there, the white savior stuff, um, but really kind of seeing this re direct relationship. And I used to work with toddlers and teenagers, you know, two groups of people who can't really make do something they don't want to do. And, and adults are, you know, same thing in terms of intrinsic motivation. What's my actual why? Um, and kind of drilling down and getting connected to that. Um, all the things that I get to unlearn and heal from, from white oppressor training that was indoctrinated in all of my upbringing. And um, that kind of solidarity piece shifted how I came to my, how I show up in terms of activism or allyship with my colleagues of color. Um, and specifically, you know, a key skill set here, and I'm seeing this be rampant in the sector, is around healthy conflict. And so being able to skill up around healthy conflict directly correlates to how, how racial equity is being advanced or can directly correlate to if you're able to retain staff of color. And so I live also in the Pacific Northwest where we have some communication norms as conflict aversion, passive aggressiveness, and those communication norms are everywhere, but there's a high concentration of it here in the Pacific Northwest in a very particular way. And I grew up here, so I've got a beat on it. Um, but this piece around being able to grapple and being able to surface really hard things or feel hard feelings and still stay in it. Um, and so when I think about accomplice, it's about the risk taking, what risks am I willing to take um, and things I'm gonna let go of or give up or things I'm gonna gain as an accomplice um, or in, 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 you know, another term around co-conspirator. I really think about that as about the relationship, the co, I'm in it with you. My liberation truly is wrapped up in your liberation. Again, that kind of makes it so that the martyrdom, the white savior stuff has to kind of, you know, fall by the wayside and unlearn those patterns. And specifically, I work with white women um, from my own lived experience of looking out in the sector and being like, dang, there's so many white women. We're like weeds popping up everywhere. We're just all over the place in education, in nonprofits, in healthcare. And what's up with that? Like, why? Why? What's the deal? And there's so much there around martyrdom and also helping being us being helpful and helping being tied to our worth and unlearning that and healing from that and um, has really served kind of how I end, end up showing up with my colleagues of color um, in the interpersonal way and then in a bigger way as well. So those are the three things I think about a lot in terms of what I would love to see our sector shift around, heal from, unlearn, um, and do better to actually have um, the kind of work that we'd like to have be really actually impactful. 
That's great. That's great. Thank you, the three of you, for sharing such beautiful sentiments. For our next question, you know, we talk about what the dysfunction is that we see around this topic, but we want to now talk about what's emerging that gives you hope. What are actions that people can take? What are recommendations, suggestions, um, inspiration that people can take with them of how they can start within, maybe start within their organization, how we can start to shift the sector? So I would love to hear what you're seeing right now that's giving you hope and what you'd want to share with others. And please keep adding to the chat and ask any questions that you have, because we will be going to Q&A after this section of the, the talk. So Trella, I would love to hear from you. What's giving you hope? What, what would you recommend? Um, you know, one of the things that is really powerful is that often when we think about allyship, race work, um, equity, belonging, et cetera, we keep relegating it to the activist. And, you know, this is, this is their job. They can teach us, they can show us, that they can engage us. And what I'm really seeing more of is conversations in traditional and or mainstream environments, whether it's offices or organizations or even major corporations, um, where they're starting this dialogue around what does it mean to be more understanding, to be more empathetic, to be more focused. So that is a, a different trend to me. And I think when, when the George Floyd um, murder happened and there was all these people who were taking to the streets and people were so excited because there was a diversity in people who were engaging, people were like, yes, yes, that's what we want to see. But it was very difficult to articulate what that meant. And what I saw was an opportunity to have conversations every day, as opposed to only in forums like these, where people who are coming here, they're seeking out the information. Now we're having conversations in places where it's not designated as a race conversation or designated as an as a equity conversation. Um, and I think that is what we have been long overdue for. Um, and to, to those of us who are in very conservative environments, um, I, I watch Fox News because I need to understand what they're thinking and talking about. Um, for the, the fact that we don't see eye to eye on pretty much anything, I'll just name that. I actually get excited because they are now learning the terms. They're learning the terms to combat them but they are actually helping us move the conversation forward because now people are understanding the terms that we've been saying all along about what equity means, what, you know, what, what allyship means. And those conversations can now happen with people who weren't even aware or oriented to it. So that gives me a lot of hope, but I wanted to make sure that we challenge ourselves to claim that language as well so that it is not being used against all of us who really want change. So that's what's, that's what's giving me hope right now. Mm, that's great, that's awesome. Yes, the words language is so important. That was a lot of our original conversation, right? About language. Uh, Toby or Fleur, jump in. Fleur, do you wanna go or you want me to go? Go for it. Okay, all right. Um, I love what Trella is naming as well and what Floor has shared earlier and what, what's resonating for me that I wasn't really going to name because I've been sitting with it a bit, but Trella's like kind of started to tap on it is the whole karmic piece is like, I really believe in spiritual law. I really believe in the power of spiritual law and karma is one of those things. And so I think it's, um, it's almost like a phenomena of the irony that race was an invention created right by by white Europeans coming to this country and that there's a reckoning of it there's a reckoning of it around that that feels very karmic and at the same time as Trell is naming them using the having to learn the language to avoid talking about what they created is karmic in and of itself that they have to now talk about what they created after wanting to not talk about what has been created. And I just think that that's really um, um, interesting to, to consider in the space. I'm getting really hopeful about the emergence of that continues that we're continuing to see the racial reckoning, 
like we're continuing to see it not stop. And we've seen it stop before. I feel like we've seen this out before. And I just feel like it's really bubbled in a different kind of way. Um, normalizing this work gives me hope. The fact that more people are digging into doing this, even if they're scared, even if they don't quite know how, um, that's giving me hope that there's less gatekeeping happening. Um, the way this work is linked to emotional intelligence, to trauma, to healing, there's so many... Um, prongs, if you will, to how to access being more equitable and more inclusive. That gives me hope. And then finally, what is giving me just deep hope is the young people. And when I say the young people, I don't mean like just like the 20 somethings. I mean, like the middle schoolers, the high schoolers, the elementary school kids, they want to be different because they haven't changed yet from, from, from going to their corners, if you will. They haven't um, been fully toxified by their own conditioning. And so I see them and hear the stories from their parents where white parents, where their kids are pushing back on them and creating some unlearning in the home to happen in a way that I think that white parents are really listening. And so our young people digging into this, being exposed to it in powerful ways using their power to teach the adults and teach their parents to interrupt the otherwise aspects of conditioning that would happen. The conditioning would happen because it's often ignored by parents. And so um, I'm just loving that. And it's making me very hopeful that while we are on the front end of this movement in so many ways, um, our kids will be seeing it through. I really believe that our kids and grandchildren will be seeing it through. Gives me hope as well. I love that. Fleur, what do you think? Sure. Thank you, Trilla and Toby. Um, you know, I'm thinking about what gives me hope or kind of the how to continue on is around connection and relationship. Um, oppression disconnects us from ourselves, from each other. And so one symptom of white supremacy culture is like we're floating heads, right? We're conditioned to be these floating heads that intellectualize things and compartmentalize and have things be transactional um, in, in our sector, like, you know, the helping profession, the service, you know, ser providing services or helping people is transactional. Same thing with funders, it's all very transactional. And so this kind of dissolving of that and anchoring things in connection and relationship. So me connecting to myself, having there be a somatics piece here. What am I feeling in my body when I'm triggered or defensive or what have you? I can't think when those things are happening. So I'm not gonna be able to um, just think my way out of this. And that that's hard for white folks. They wanna just like strategize and tactics and like all the words like frameworks and blah, 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 our way out of this and it's just not apparently it hasn't worked yet, you know? So this thing of, of really anchoring in connection and being in relationship, being in relationship with myself, with each other um, for realsies, not just kind of like sorta, but um, for realsies being in, in relationship. Um, that's my, my pro professional technical term there. Um, and then I think this thing of um, kind of holding a couple, like a lot of strategies or a lot of um, multi-prong approach is needed and sometimes um, by any means necessary. And what I mean by that or what I'm thinking of is, um, you know, I'm working with a lot of clients where they're really just now joining like the equity train or they're just now coming to the party um, and they're mostly doing it because they don't want to be caught not doing it. Right. So it's inside of performative and it's inside of I don't want to be the last one doing this. Right. Um, and so that's what I mean by like, great, we'll take you, you know, um, by any means necessary, whatever got you here it could be a BS reason. But um, sometimes you got to use the BS to outsmart the BS. Right. And and I think in the BS being like white supremacy culture and oppression. Yeah. And and other times there's like, well, the means absolutely do justify the ends. And so if you're treating racial equity work, diversity, IQ inclusion, whatever you're calling it, if you're treating it like business as usual, we're going to roll out this initiative, we're going to meet the benchmarks, we're going to evaluate it, it's not going to work because that's inside the messed up framework. That's inside white supremacy culture around quantity over quality and defensiveness and all that kind of stuff. So I think kind of like having this judgment 
Um, and I'm seeing people kind of grapple with this and it's, it's inspiring. Um, it's also overwhelming because it's like, holy moly, like what do we do differently, right? Like people are be awakening to like, it could be different. It doesn't have to be this way. Um, and so I think about whenever I'm not sure, I go back to connection. Whenever I'm not sure what to do with people, I go back to relationship and that that's our anchor. Um, and I'm seeing people doing that more and more um, because this can't be kind of like a tokenizing performative thing. Well, it just won't get you very far. You know, like you'll, you'll, we will mess up too much, right? We'll just mess up too much. And a lot of times the mistakes are so embarrassing that we retreat. So if we're based in connection and relationship, then, um, then it really shifts the quality of the experience that I might mess up, but um, I'm, I'm dedicated, I'm trustworthy. I, I know that you, I have your back and you have my back and we're in it together enough that um, the sentiment that there's nothing we can't come back from. And that was revolutionary to me. I did not make that up. I was a part of a program where people said that and I was like, I've never experienced that. I've mostly been a part of things where you would be cut out. And so a lot of that's my own cultural and family of origin. And so this idea that there's nothing we can't come back from, that that's how in it we are with each other, um, that really shifts how, this, how, how we do everything. I just wanna jump in and name really quickly that when we talk about what brings us hope, being on a panel with two women of color and a white woman and the white woman is the first one to say white supremacy culture, that's change, okay? That's change and I get excited. That's what radical allyship looks like. You wanna know what it looks like when you don't have to be the one to keep saying we're hurting, stop hurting us and somebody else can name the hurt and identify what it does to you, that's radical allyship. I just wanted to name that. Amen. <laughs> and, and for real Z's will now be added to my, <laughs> to my repertoire as well. I love that, I love that. And I, I would ask, and any, any questions that y'all have, please put, um, in the chat, I'll ask one to get us started. So start putting them. Thanks, Alexa, for adding one. Um, we hear a lot about calling in and calling out and this whole idea of like cancel culture and like all these things. Can any of you speak to the, your thoughts around that? You know, we've talked about like relationship. It's beyond transactional. It's it's commitment to difficult conversations for, for any of us that are having that tension, right? Trying to hold that tension of calling in and calling out. Can you speak to that? What are your thoughts, any of you? I can share something here. Um, my dear colleague, Andrea Lee Singh, who I, I do a lot of work with, she talks about accountability as um, you know, support. Let me support you being your highest self. And um, I think you know, it kicks up a lot in folks like, ah, punitive, or I'm, I'm wrong, I'm bad, I'm not okay, you know, I'm gonna be humiliated, like all that stuff comes up. And um, it really is about calling us forward and integrity. And, um, and then, you know, all the stuff to wade through around defensiveness or what have you. And, and people just also have straight up like vastly different information sets that they're working from. Um, and I think I'll just share one piece here that I'm seeing a lot of, you know, the generational differences and Toby really uplifted, like our young people are at the tip of the spear, piercing us through to um, what's possible. Um, but a lot of generational norms, boomers, I'm 42, Gen X, millennials, blah, blah, um, are opposite norms. Young people are asking for accountability, transparency, um, shared decision making. And older folks are like, you haven't earned that, you know, like those kind of polarities. And so ideas about what's respectful, um, you know, who should hold who accountable, like young people and without positional authority are asking leadership to to share their decision-making process and leadership's like, say what, who are you, you know? So those generational differences, we have the most generations in the workforce right now, over five, and they, some of them have like literally opposite norms and preferences and that thing of like, there's, there's these, we have different normals, right? And each one is it's relative to each other. If my normal is not your normal, and then the piece of privilege is, I think that my normal is not only normal, but it's right. And that that's the key kind of piece here about privilege is that my normal is seen as is everywhere and that is right. Um, I know I went off on a little bit of a tangent here and people asked you know more about accountability and how do you talk to other folks, but I think understanding that landscape can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Trella, Toby, what are you thinking? With the calling in, calling out. 
So call in, call out culture to me is another one of those binary determinations that we continue to make. It's, you know, all this way or all that way. And the reality is that when you are to, to floor setting the premise for this, you know, it depends on who you're working with, how you're orienting to them, what are they receptive to? If we are trying to move the conversations forward to try to get people to identify a framework or a checklist or a way to approach every conversation is just not going to be effective. And I think that's part of the um, thing that always gives me concern is that people get frustrated with this process because it's not black and white. It's not process. It's not this and that and this and that and this and that. It is very nuanced. It is very deeply rooted. A, a white supremacy culture is literally an entire societal systemic structure in, in ways that we participate in and reinforce. And sometimes that is hereditary because our ancestors have taught us to do, I mean, it's just, it's really deep and elaborate. So then to the, go layer on that to say, here's a framework that works, call them in and da 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 or call them out and da 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 and then it backfires whichever one you've been taught to do, it backfires. Then it's like, whoa, well, I did what they taught me to do. It's not that simple. Really, the essence of it is finding our empathy and understanding people and trying to build a place where we all fit and supporting and elevating, to Floor's point, the best person that you can be. And I'm here to support you in that. I'm going to name for you that you really struggle with me calling you out in, in, in front of other folks. I need to help you unpack that so that the next time I have to do it, you're comfortable with being called out. And, but I've called you in the first time, you know, or you are totally comfortable because you're used to being called out and I call you out and you're like, yeah, sorry. And you keep moving and it, it doesn't have any effect at all because you're used to being called out and it doesn't even matter to you. So you don't change your behavior. So we really have to be mindful in how we're engaging with each other and recognize the layers that we're dealing with and how deep this goes and consistently be doing our own work when we're trying to engage with each other. I love that, I love that. Such a beautiful way that you expressed it. Toby, you wanna add any thoughts and we have another question? Go ahead. Um, I'll be very short because my colleagues have both named it so beautifully and captured so much of what I would have added. Part of what I've been sitting with around the call out culture is how that in and of itself is performative and harmful and how people are doing it to be self-serving and creating further harm. And for for me, again, people not recognizing the nuance, particularly white people not rec recognizing the nuance are, are seeing um, destructive behaviors and that I think cause them to shrink and not want to run the risk of being called out because they see people doing the things that we are doing as colleagues when we lead for this work that are using the work as a platform to create more work <laughs> by nature of calling out and creating harm. And so... Um, so that's been really troublesome for me and something that I've been sitting with and, and even not feeling completely at ease in my own sense of uh, psychological safety in terms of reaching out to those colleagues and even naming the why around that for them. So I can just imagine that it goes even deeper for people who don't even feel like they have you know, equal footing, if you will, for lack of a better way to say it, to, to, to do that for themselves. Mm -hmm. Such an important point. Mm -hmm. There is a question from Kate that talks about power. Um, Kate is asking, can you all share more about um, to how best to address power hoarding, one of the many characteristics of white supremacist culture, um, seeing that in problematic situations with leadership and boards, and especially within the sector, if, if we know that most of the sector is white, that the concentration of power and executive leadership teams and boards is overwhelmingly white and you know, legacy and all of that there, how can our practitioners, folks like all of us that are in the sector, how can they start to address those dynamics? Anyone jump in? 
When I think about the power hoarding component, I really think about power being used as a gatekeeper and that a lot of the, the, the people in power in those types of positions on boards and executive directors and CEOs, that because they really haven't done a lot of their own work, when they say, oh, we're not ready for this or that we can't do that quite yet is really, they're not ready for it. Generally, the people who are not sitting at that table with them are ready for it, have been ready for it. And, and so I see the power hoarding as really a gatekeeping mechanism to, to not lean into the discomfort of this work. And I don't think they're even making meaning of really surrendering power. I don't think that's really the truth of what is being protected. I think their own comfort and status and other aspects of white supremacy culture are really what is being challenged and not so much power. Mm, Trailer Fleur, any thoughts on the question on power hoarding? I'll share, um, kind of building on what Toby just named there, some strategies to kind of address it. I, I feel like I'm seeing it's, um, you know, when in doubt, you always go back to the mission. We're here to meet our mission. And it's the organization's job to figure out how to best do that, right? You have your specific missions, you know, statement and your programming. Um, but when in doubt, how do you know, that's the, that's the, the, the question, how do we meet our mission? And, um, and the world's changing. And so this, this idea of leadership is meeting what's wanted and needed. What is wanted and needed from our organization now? What kind of leadership is wanted and needed from our executive leadership from our board? Um, and that you know, that goes back to a little bit of like use, use the BS to outsmart the BS. Like if you want to look good and be the one doing the best thing or whatever, right? Like using that to like actually do some real good work. Like if that's a strategy that would work, like, okay, start there. As long as you know that that's what you're doing and being conscious of it. Um, and the other thing I've noticed is that it's hard for people to change um, or shift or let down the defensiveness, which would like open up their hands to the, of the power hoarding um, when they don't feel honored or um, seen for their contributions. And what's tricky about that is it might be inside of their paternalism and inside of their martyrdom and inside of their white savior, like all the like crappy things that they're wanting to be recognized for within, you know, and that's, so it's, it's complicated there, but again, going back to generational differences, I was just on a call before this where um, um, older, well, they're not even older, they're folks in their forties and fifties, I'm 42. Um, we're talking about feeling not honored or recognized from the young folks who are asking for transparency, who are asking for, um, you know, more accountability. And so there's this interesting tension there, right? And people do need to be valued and honored um, without co-signing their BS, right? Like we can do both. We can value and honor without allowing harmful um, kind of power dynamics to keep going. And so it's a tricky line. And of course, um, again, you know, you go back to relationship. What does this person need? Um, and what can they hear? You know, some of this is a lot about messaging. And again, you get to figure out, um, you know, where your integrity lies with that. Are we going to shift the messaging enough so they hear it without compromising our values or integrity? Um, and you get to like figure out, you know, taking some like trial and error with that. I just want to piggyback a little bit or veggie back, depending on where you sit on the Eaton scale. Um, to Flora's point on use the BS to call out the BS. Um, when we talk about power, it's usually because somebody's holding on to something and we can't, we've got to tap into what they're holding on to. When you talk about boards though, in, in leadership, almost every organization that we interact with, particularly, particularly in the nonprofit sector is here to help a cause. They're trying to fix something or, or, or contribute to something. And so when you look at the, there's a ton of articles of the benefits of diversity. And my favorite one in a, in a panel of all white conservative males is productivity <laughs> and, and the fact that it is beneficial to the bottom line. They love that. It works every freaking time. And so if that's what it takes to get the door open to start implementing change, use that to get the door open and address that power dynamic. 
and then start converting and changing and moving the, the needle. But we often are so afraid when, when we feel like we're trying to do something. And this also goes all the way back to where we started. When we feel like we're doing this because we want to feel good about ourselves and we're doing something for charitable purposes, it seems wrong to talk about productivity or profitability. But when we're doing something because it needs to be done, all the tools in our toolbox are helpful. And we can use all the tools in our toolbox because what we really want is a place for belonging for everybody. That's what we're really trying to get. So that, that really can help us shift our frameworks and think like we're not doing this because you know people of color need to be supported better. We're doing this because we need to do this for everybody. So all the tools work. Mm, I love that, such a good point. Another really good question, um, Jess Blackshaw says, I also believe that intrinsic motivation is deeply important for allyship to be sustainable and non-performative, but I hear a lot of pushback to the idea that allies should think about their own liberation because it constitutes centering themselves rather than people who are oppressed. How would you talk about the difference between finding intrinsic motivation and centering yourself? Who has thoughts about that? Y'all gonna make me go again, okay. <laughs> we keep conflating conversations. If this is about you, what you want, what you need, how you want to feel better, you are censoring yourself. If this is about creating belonging and space and understanding where you connect with someone else, you have to understand yourself to figure out where you're not connecting. Those are not the same thing. Um, and I do think that we challenge each other, you know, oh, you, you know, you, you're talking about your feelings. Well, let's see, if I'm in a moment and someone else has been abused and I'm crying and not giving them space to have their emotions, I have made it about me. There's an order of empathy and priority that we have to think about. So if we are really trying to connect and create a space of belonging, the traumatized person goes first. And if we need to orient about that, think about a child. If a child is riding a bike and they fall down and skin their knee and you fall down on the street and start crying because you have to look at them skin in their knee, people are gonna think you're crazy. Your instinct is to go to the child, take care of the child and then deal with your emotions. And that's how we need to deal with the traumatic situations and circumstances that we're seeing. But that doesn't mean that that parent or that caregiver doesn't have their own emotions and need to process like, Am I being overprotective over this kid? Am I now, you know, doing things that are harmful to that person? And I need to make sure that I'm growing as a caregiver for that child. So it's not that you can't grow in yourself and be a better person in yourself, particularly where it impacts the connections you're trying to make. So let's not conflate those two when we're talking about whether you're centering yourself. I'd love to add to that, Trilla. Um, you know, I think from white supremacy culture characteristics, the either or thinking, right? It's it's not one or the other. You just gave all this nuance and context and the discernment. And I think partly what happens is oppression makes it so we don't think very well. And that's how it stays in place and kind of perpetuates. And so this idea around developing judgment and discernment. And um, as white folks, we have bad judgment and are not able to discern very well about how to show up. And that's that's part of like, that's one thing I would specifically name as an intrinsic motivation for me is I want my mind back so that I can actually be in it, right? And I wanna be able to know, and I wanna be able to like develop better judgment and be able to see the discerning context and nuances that are needed. Um, and so that's kind of a, a how I think about it. And um, another piece here is like accountability, one specific action of accountability um, that I think about is, is doing my own healing work so that I can show up um, and cleanly and powerfully and be a reliable ally, someone that is trustworthy. And that doesn't mean I go away, fix myself, come back perfect, right? Which is inside of white supremacy culture. Um, but that piece of that um, doing my own healing work um, really allows me so that I can actually show up um, in a way that is of service 
versus centering myself. And I think it is confusing, right? Like a lot of what we're being asked for is, is humanity, to show our humanity, um, be outraged, have feelings, <clears throat> and the discernment to know when to have your feelings and show them. I'll just speak for me as a white woman, like when do I show my feelings? When do I cry or not cry in a public space, right? White women's tears have had a particular impact historically. So we need to understand that context. And I think about it's, it's really, you know, feelings are when and with whom. And so that is a place to develop judgment. And that's what I mean by we have bad judgment in that area. We don't know when and with whom to show our feelings and show our humanity. There's absolutely lots of times in particular for white leaders, people need to know that like you're having a, an emotional experience, that you're outraged or that you're confused or whatever. And so the emotional intelligence skills to be able to like name that and like, it's like having two tracks. I'm gonna have my feelings and I'm gonna have my thinking too. But that's only because I've done a certain amount of work so that my feelings don't take over my thinking. I can stay present, I can stay connected. I cannot make it about me, but I can also show and let you in on my humanity. And that's a skill set to develop, to be able to show without it overtaking. Um, and that, you know, that, that's a part of how oppression has harmed all humans is that this thing about being floating heads or, you know, the way mental health oppression kind of like combines in here um, and doesn't allow for humanness. Um, and that's sort of what we're trying to get back to with liberation. I love that. There's an important question that Alexa raises up, you know, what do we do when these conversations are with folks that are bigoted? They're harmful, right? There's, there's harm being done. You know that this person is not the person you can talk with, you know, lack of reciprocity, allowing for making mistakes and failures, teaching how to heal and rebuild. Um, so there's, there's a lot there. So I, can you speak to that when it's, it's outright harm. What do you do in those situations? Toby, go ahead. Um, a, a lot of times we enter those spaces, particularly as allies in wanting to change people. And we have to do our own inner work that allows us to show up by being skillful at both curiosity and non-judgment so that we create an invitation to change. That's a different way of showing up and being embodied from I'm going to change you to I'm going to offer some of this to you to invite you to make your change. People don't change because we change them. No one's ever changed because we've changed and we know we can't change people. That's like, you know, relationship rule 101. <laughs> yeah, and, and so again, how do we create the invitation for change. And so we have to become very skillful about our own curiosity questions that we're posing. How are we showing up? Where's the warmth that we bring around the belonging piece? Because it is about inclusion and belonging. That is what it is at its core. So that's my piece. And it's easy for us to want to judge and for wanting to be, um, that energy of like aggression, like we can force this to happen and we cannot force it to happen. We can create conditions for it to happen very well. Trella, any thoughts? Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna add to Toby said, there's a story and there, I saw some folks on here who are from Durham, North Carolina. So I, if you know the names of these folks, please let me fill this in for me. There's a story about the civil rights movement about a white man and a black woman who um, were completely at odds with each other on integrating um, schools. And they the, the white man was considered bigoted and racist and the black woman was an activist and trying to um, desegregate schools. And they ended up talking and being forced to talk because the school system put them together and they ultimately became great family friends. And it's a beautiful, if you haven't heard about it, it's a beautiful story. But I, every time somebody mentions somebody being bigoted to me, I think about that. And I think about, you know, what was that relationship like? What was the crossroads that made them come together at some point and realize that they were just human beings trying to figure out what they thought was best and somehow they got to the same point at the same time and were able to then take that journey together. So 
it, it couldn't be forced. It couldn't be demanded. It couldn't be, you know, mandatory. And Durham ended up integrating its schools with no reports of violence in the school system. And that is, that's super powerful. And, and it, it's almost unheard of. And I think it's something that should be a national book story, something, movie, something. But if anybody knows that story, yes, please, they're, they're sharing it in the chat. Um, but I think that when we think about how we deal with bigoted folks and we're coming at them, literally live, I'm going to make you see this. I'm going to make you understand how wrong you are. You haven't created a space of belonging for them. And that's so hard. We can't, we, we, we're trying to create a space of belonging for everybody. Now, don't get me wrong and don't get Toby wrong. Don't get Flo wrong. This is not easy, yo. <laughs> like, it's not easy. And if you don't have the patience or the self uh, power to do it, stay out of that fight. Elect to stay out of that fight because that fight is not yours. Direct them, orient them, share with them. Just show them love because that is your orientation. But if it's not your fortitude to take that on, please don't, because you can do a lot more harm and reinforce negative thinking if you take it on and you're not ready. Mm, can I just add to that really quickly? Of course, of course. That's it. It's not easy. We have to have the fortitude. And that's literally why I tell people leading for this work is a lifestyle. It is not a title. It is not something that you just like, oh, you know what? I think I'm going to go do that. It is not, it is not a pivot. Let me just don't let me get me started. I just want to name, <laughs> I just want to name. It is a lifestyle and it requires the inner work. It requires self-care. It requires the knowledge and awareness. It requires the ability to be skillful with yourself and with others. And so do we all need to be engaged in some way? Yes, but it looks different. The way Trell is also naming it is like, what level are you getting in at? Because it looks different. And there's a way of being and a way that we have to support the way of being to stay in this and not burn out. Because the racial fatigue is real. Thank you. I love that. Y'all are amazing. Oh. So, so love this conversation. It's so great. What we want to do is um, use this last couple minutes. I want to hear from each of our speakers. If they, if each of you could share maybe like a minute summary or so of um, really what's present for you, what, what came out of your breakout room that you're de-identifying and sharing um, what you're thinking about right now that you want to leave with us as a gift um, from all the amazing wisdom that you've shared. So who wants to go first? Oh, wow. Part of the takeaway that I know landed in our space was really around um, this work being a lifestyle and what that looks like. Also, how this work being a lifestyle can be impacted by characteristics around white supremacy culture and how we all embody those characteristics in some way and how that can impact um, the urgency around this the nuance around this, the um, there are no hard and steady rules around this that can often create confusion for um, white people in the space, but also new people to the space of doing this work. And um, and those were some of the bigger takeaways. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Trella. Yeah, we, we had a really interesting conversation about doing harm in communities. Of course, no, no one wants to do harm. And um, we were talking, basically, when we think about showing up in the space, one of the, the almost guaranteed ways to do harm is to show up with your quote unquote expertise to do the work without listening to the community you're trying to serve and having them tell you what their problems are or their challenges are or their needs or their support or even accepting that they don't have the problem that you've identified. Um, so, you know, that, that is a quick surefire way to get to doing harm 
but also recognizing that at some point, each and every one of us is going to do harm. The question is, what will you learn from it and how will you grow from it and how will you be a better person to do better the next time that you do it and also take an accountability for the harm that you do. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Fleur. Yeah, thank you. Um, really lovely to be with the folks in my group. Um, you know, a couple things came up around just self-care, collective care, um, and that piece of, of like caring for ourselves, caring for each other. Um, as we sort of claw our way out of oppression and towards um, healing and, and liberation um, in whatever shape or form. It can take a meandering path. Um, some things are, are directly linked and, um, and just that idea of like being, being with each other, just kind of being in it and being with each other um, awkwardly <laughs> stumbling, you know, like kind of however we show up, whatever our, our idiosyncrasies are, et cetera, um, as we as we reach, kind of like reach for each other. Those are some of my takeaways from my small group. I love that. Thank you so much, Toby, Trella, and Fleur for being our amazing guides through this conversation. And to all of you that attended and, and stuck with us, we, um, Devin has already put it, she's so on top of it, the link for the next episode, it'll be May 11th with Mallory Erickson. We're talking about disrupting fundraising. This is one of our special events. It's a 90 minute workshop. So it's different than this panel model. So we do special events about one or two a quarter. And um, Mallory is going to talk about ways to really center assets thinking and how to disrupt the power dynamics within that fundraising structure, you know, of like giver, receiver, donor, funder, all those pieces. So she has this really great model that she's going to share with all of us. And it will leave you with um, tactical like activities and structures that you can put into place right away in your work if you are engaged with fundraising. So share that with others. And uh, we're working on some juicy topics for the rest of May and into the summer. So we'll definitely be in touch. We're going to send you an email with a recording of today's uh, session episode. We're going to send you a list of resources and all the links to get involved in the LinkedIn group, sign up for future episodes, everything you need. So you'll keep hearing from us. So thank you again for sharing your time and space with us. And thank you again to our amazing speakers. And I wish you all lots of great health and safety. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.